Thank you, Dan. I want to spend just a moment talking about the work that I do with search. You have been one of the strongest supporters and the strongest supporter, I suppose, that we have in the Little Rock area and on this particular station. And from the bottom of my heart, I want to say to you, thank you. Thank you for your support. I realize that for AT&T and DirecTV that there's been a fuss going on between CW station and uh, that, that uh, cable service. Uh, let me encourage you uh, to go to GEB. I know it comes on very early at 6.30 in the morning. Uh, if you go to Fox News on 6.30 and go two more clicks up, you're on GEB. And we come on at 6.30 on that particular area. Hopefully, uh, CW and Fox can get their acts together with AT&T and get things straightened out. I, I know we've waited for quite a little while to do that. But uh, we want to be back on. And uh, at least if you can't do that, you can get it through GEB. I watched it Sunday morning, and uh, I appreciated getting to see it on that channel. I didn't realize that it was on that late, and that's really not, not too bad. But that little red button, you know, if you, if you hit that little red button, it'll save it. So if you go in your guide to that and you don't want to get up at 630, you can hit that button, and if you hit twice, it'll record it every week. The search program has been on, it'll be 43 years come September. Uh, that is one of the longest running programs, I guess, around this day and time. God has blessed us in so many ways. In this last 18 months, we have had the very best support we have ever had, and much of it from Arkansas. In the last 18 months, we have had the widest outreach that we have ever had. Uh, a year ago, in April, we began broadcasting nationwide in Canada. So there are some places that we're going now that we weren't going the last time I was here. We're also translating a lot of our materials into Spanish, and we have a special page with Spanish materials on it. It's only in written form at this point, but it's there, and we're hoping to, uh, hoping to enlarge that uh, as weeks go by. We're on about 200 broadcast stations like Channel 38. Uh, we're on three networks, the GEB network. We're on News Nation, which is the old WG in America. And we're also on uh, the Cowboy Channel. That's kind of interesting. But all three of these networks go nationwide. So we are nationwide in all 210 television markets. And... Uh, uh, we're happy to, to broadcast all over the United States, all over Canada. You can get us, and if you can get TV in Alaska, you can get the search program. If you can get it in Hawaii, I mean, if you have TV in Hawaii, you can get it there. We're on in about 30 other countries. You can see us throughout the Caribbean. We're on in Guyana. We're on in Belize. We're on in uh, parts of Mexico. Even in Cuba, you can see our program uh, by satellite. And so there are a lot of things that we're doing as far as outreach. We're also on about 70 radio stations. God has opened up these doors for us in marvelous ways. If you cannot get our program on TV, you can get it on YouTube on Monday. The program that appeared yesterday will appear today on YouTube. And if you subscribe to our channel, you'll be able to see it. Uh, God has opened up a lot of doors for us. Not only have we had the best support and we've had the largest outreach we have also had the most response since January. And I really want to encourage you with regard to this to pray for us. Uh, in January, there was a lady from Alaska who called. And she was looking for a church home and wanted to be baptized according to the teaching of the Scriptures, her words. Later on in that same month, I was down in Florida and I met a preacher down there. And he had a friend who showed up at church one day and wanted to be baptized. They wanted to be baptized and to be a part of a biblical church home. We offer that to everywhere we go. We will help you find one. And it seems like almost every week since January, somebody's been calling, wanting to find a church home. These are not people who are members of the Church of Christ. Wanting to find a church home and wanting to be baptized into Christ according to the teaching of the Scriptures. Let me mention to you, and I will make this point again tomorrow at more detail, doctrine is winning souls. When we preach doctrine, 
those primary doctrines of the church and of salvation, we can win souls. When we did it back in years past, our churches were growing. When we stopped preaching doctrine and primary doctrine, our churches quit growing and became other things. If we are to remain sound and what God would have us to be, we must preach primary doctrine. Now, it does cost a lot of money for us to do what we do, and I wanted to thank you for your contributions. It costs us about $10,000 a day to do what we do. And, uh, but I do not know of any other program that reaches as many people for the kind of money that we have to spend. And uh, our outreach just continues to grow and grow. Uh, we've had people from Alaska and Florida, Georgia. We've had three from Michigan. We've had two from Kentucky. We've had them from Arkansas over near uh, Fort Smith. We've had them from Oklahoma and Texas. We've had them from various places like Washington, D.C. and Washington State and New York State. People are listening to the search program who have never heard the gospel, and they are enjoying what they're hearing. I'm telling you, preaching and teaching primary doctrinal things is not a waste of time. It is what is making a difference in the people who are coming to us looking for a church home. There are many people throughout the United States that feel like their church has left them because of all of the changes in our culture, morally and otherwise. And so they're looking for something that has some substance, something that has the truth. And what we're providing is a program that goes into everyone's home that can do that. And anyway, I just wanted to mention those things to you and to thank you for all that you have done because this is as much a part of your ministry as it is my own. And so God bless you and thank you. Whenever the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Rome, he had never been there. He had never laid eyes on the church there. That church had gone through a lot of this and that and had some struggles and he wanted to deal with some of those struggles. But one of the things that he wanted to do... Chapter 1, verse 5, is he wanted to bring about as an apostle the obedience of the faith. The obedience of faith. He mentions that phrase, obedience of faith, over at the end of the book in Romans chapter 16, verses 26 and 27. When you have a phrase from a Jewish writer that has something at the beginning and has something at the end, that is a primary phrase. And it is the kind of phrase that should be remembered all the way through the reading of that book. It is not enough just to believe. The kind of faith that the book of Romans is talking about is an obedient faith. And that is true as you read through the entire book. But what we wanted to do was to focus on chapter 1, verses 14 to 17. And here the Apostle Paul writes to them and he says, I'm under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. And thus, for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, The righteous man shall live by faith. Thankfully, many of these Romans did obey the faith. They were obedient to the word of God. In the book of Romans chapter 6 and verse 16, it says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, that you're that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? And then he says, But God be thanked. That though you were the slaves of sin, that's the way you were in the past, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free, you became the slaves of righteousness. You see, the Romans used to be slaves of sin. But when they obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, that pattern that God gave of doctrine, then they were freed from their sin. And made slaves of righteousness. You see, people can change. Don't ever let anyone tell you that people cannot change. I don't know where that lie started, 
I've got a few things that I think, but don't let anybody say that. Well, this is just the way I am and I can't change. Of course you can change. You can be what God wants you to be. And these people who were slaves of sin, yeah, they were caught up in it, addicted, enslaved, but they changed and they became slaves of righteousness when they obeyed the gospel. When they obeyed the gospel. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 11, it says, Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men, but we're made manifest to God, and I hope that we're made manifest also in your conscience. We need to be people who recognize that the gospel matters. And being obedient to the gospel and obedient to God matters. Because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. That story of the death, burial, and resurrection Now, if we want to ask, well, what specifically is the gospel? I think 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 5, you may want to turn there, tells us about what the gospel is. And in that passage, Paul writes, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you. It was a preached message that he had declared. He says, which also you received. Not only was it preached, it was received. And he says, in which you stand. They took their stand on the gospel. And he says, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preach to you, unless you believed in vain. Now, the gospel is a message that came from God. Paul received it from the Lord. He declared it and he preached it. The people heard it and they took their stand on it. Now, to receive something means that you are going to listen to it and you're going to agree with it and you're going to say, this is right, I believe this. They believed it so strongly they took a stand on it. It must have been very difficult in the first century at Rome or in Corinth or anywhere else for people to take a stand on the fact that there's only one God and not many gods, that there is only one Lord and not many lords, that Jesus is bigger and better than even Caesar. And when you think about how that they would be saved by this message, it was an important thing for them. They took their stand on it. And you know what? We have to take our stand on what we believe as well if we're going to make any difference at all. The only people who ever accomplish anything in this world are people of conviction. People who say, I don't know, or I don't care, or who knows. Never accomplish anything. The people who accomplish things are the people who take their stand on things. And he says, if you take your stand on this, that you'll be saved by it, if you continue to hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed it in vain. He says, for I delivered, and here's the message, I delivered to you, uh, the, that word uh, the, of first importance, that which I also received. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He arose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen by Cephas, that is Peter, and then by the twelve. And so there was the death, the burial, the resurrection, and His appearances that He really did rise from the dead and that we can have confidence in. Now when they took their stand on these things, they would suffer persecution. But they were willing to take a stand and sacrifice themselves for their faith. They were willing to hold fast to it because it would make a difference. Folks in the church, we're not selling a box of soap. And we're not saying our soap is good soap and you have soap and we have soap and you can have your soap and we can have our soap. No, sir. That's not what we're doing. Nor are we asking people to buy a car or to buy a house. No, we're asking people to take their whole lives and put it into Jesus Christ. To live for Him. To put themselves aside. To crucify themselves. To no longer live for themselves, but to live for Jesus Christ. To take up their cross and follow Him. That's what Paul was asking them to do. To take a stand. And they knew that to hold fast to what Paul had preached, they would gain their hope of eternal life, their hope of heaven. I want to talk about the power of the gospel. 
And I want to talk about it maybe in a little different way than you might think. What does it do? What does the gospel do? This is exhortation, Dennis. First of all, the power of the gospel is to produce faith. Yes, faith. Romans 10 and verse 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God or the word of Christ. And yes, whenever we have faith, it comes because we believe the message. And the more you study the message, the stronger your faith will become. That's why you need to be a Bible, a daily Bible reader all the time. When I was young, we used to, in every class, take a count of how many of you were daily Bible readers? Yeah, just last, uh, last week or so, whenever I was holding a meeting in another state, the first thing they asked was, how many of you in the class are daily Bible readers? Could you hold your hand up? Are you a daily Bible reader? The greater you study the Word of God, the stronger your faith will become. And when we think about the story of the empty tomb, when we think about the stone that was rolled away, when we think about the grave clothes that were folded and left there, when we think about the devotion of the disciples, all of these things give evidence to the fact that Jesus really did indeed rise from the dead. And that according to Romans chapter 1, that whenever He arose from the dead, that the Father declared with power Jesus to be His Son. Yes, and it was done through the resurrection. It proved who He was. It proved that His Word was true. It was the kind of thing that people could hook into and know because of the evidence that was there. When I think about the testimony of the disciples and their willingness to die for their faith, how that speaks so loudly that the gospel is true, that we can place our faith and our souls in the hands of Jesus Christ. John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of His disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in His name. Yes, life in His name. Not just life, but newness of life. Not just life, but an abundant life. Not just life, but eternal life. That's what we have in the gospel. And so that faith is so important and one of the power. And it's kind of like the fruit of the Spirit. Don't ever say the fruits of the Spirit. Yes, I know there are nine things. But it's the fruit of the Spirit. And when I talk about the power of the gospel, it's not the powers of the gospel. It's the power that has all of these things that work together within it. It's an amazing, amazing story. An amazing thing. Don't ever feel like somehow or another we are people of of weakness. That we are people who can't do anything. That we have no power at all in the society in which we live. No, I tell you, the power that we have is an everlasting power. A power that cannot be snuffed out. A power that cannot be stopped. A power that the more you persecute it, the greater it grows. In the second century, there was the statement that was made that the blood of the martyrs was the seed of the kingdom. When we believe with conviction and are unafraid, we do not die in vain, even if we should die. And the church just kept growing, no matter how much they were hated, and no matter how much the society and the government opposed them. Not only is there power that is in faith, there is the power of truth. Truth. Jesus really did rise from the dead. The gospel rings true. And it is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And truth has a way of pricking the heart and getting down to, to things that really matter. The gospel is not only about the promises of God, but also look where you've been and what you've done and how you need to change. 
And there's some truth to that. And when we look inside and we see ourselves and we don't approve of ourselves and we know that we don't approve of ourselves, we begin to say, is there something better than what I have? Is there something better than this? And the gospel gives us something better. The gospel's power is the truth and its ability to set us free and to give us something nobler and more righteous to look toward than what we've ever looked for before. Truth tells sinners what they need to hear, even though what they hear may be painful. They are told what they need to hear, not simply what they want to hear. And that's the power of truth. We purify our souls, as we mentioned yesterday. We purify our souls in obeying the truth. And whenever that truth, that seed, that incorruptible seed is planted and it brings forth fruit, then we become born-again people. We're born again of an incorruptible seed, something that cannot be stopped. And And that seed is the Word of God, which lives and abides forever. The Lord Jesus Himself is the source of truth. John 1.14 says that He was full of grace and truth. In John 8, 31 and 2, He says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. A little bit later on in chapter 18, when He was speaking to Pilate, He says, You say rightly that I am a king. And He says, For this cause I was born, and for this cause I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. And everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. That's John 18, verse 37. It's the truth about sin that convicts hearts. It's the truth about the gospel and forgiveness that gives people hope, that gives people an opportunity to change their lives, that I don't have to be stuck in the way that I have been in times past, that I can be better, that I can grow and become the kind of man that God wants me to be, the kind of woman for these ladies that God wants you to be. The gospel is a door opener to life. It's a door opener to forgiveness. It's a door opener to truth. I fear sometimes we expect to convert others with kind of a dry-eyed response. It's godly sorrow over our sins that brings about repentance. 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10. The Lord Jesus gave proof of His resurrection to His disciples. Acts 1 verse 3. It was by many convincing proofs that He showed Himself alive for a period of 40 days. And to me, that's a rather strong statement. They could see Him. They could hear Him. They could touch Him. And it was that kind of proof that led them to say, no matter what you do to me, no matter how you tell me to hush, we cannot stop speaking that which we have seen and heard. We must obey God rather than men. That was what was in their heart. And God's revealed truth has that power To expose things that are fraudulent. You know, when you know the truth, you can spot a lie. When you know the truth, you can spot a fake, a counterfeit. Now, I have some $20 bills in my pocket. I don't usually have those, but sometimes I do. My wife lets me have one now and then. And uh, if you work for the federal government you would study a $20 bill and you would know everything about this $20 bill. You would know that there's some kind of yellow 20s on the back. You'd know that the White House was there. You'd know that the numbers were of different size, all of them. You would know about the paper. You would know about some of the things in the background. You'd know that Andrew Jackson was on the front of it. I don't know why, but he's on the front of it. You got all of those things. You would know every little detail about the $20 bill and the $50 bill. Those are the ones that are most frequently counterfeited and the 100. That way because you knew the the bill so well that if somebody produced a counterfeit, you could tell very quickly. When you know the truth, you can spot a counterfeit. Has there ever been a time when somebody has said something and 
Maybe you didn't know how to answer it right then, but you knew something was funny about it. That it wasn't right. It's because you had studied the truth. And then you want to go hunt up and see why what they said was not quite right. Or maybe you'd ask questions. But you knew in your heart that wasn't right. And I think about Jesus and how He gives us truth and how He gave us the things to be able to see the difference between what is right and what is wrong. To know the things that are what God wants them to be. Paul talked about how that he would never be one who would twist the truth because that was shameful. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 2. Whenever we think about faith and repentance, how that these things are necessary before baptism, that thing helps us to understand and to rule out the idea of baptism of infants and small children. When we know that baptism is immersion, the truth about it, we know that sprinkling and pouring isn't baptism. When we know that the musical worship of the church is singing and has never been anything but singing, at least not biblically, then one sees the error of going beyond the word to employ instruments. When one hears 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 33 to 37, how that the women are to keep silent in the churches. Then they realize that having women elders and women preachers are just not right. You see, the truth helps us to understand what error is. So there's the power of faith and the power of truth, but there's also another power, and that's the power of love. My master's degree is uh, one basically with apologetics. And since the 70s, I have been a student of apologetics. I love reasons to believe in in Jesus, the Christian evidences. I love that. And I have studied that for all my life, and I can give you many good reasons to believe. But if you ask me, Phil, why are you a Christian? I think of John chapter 12 and verse 32 where Jesus said, And I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto me. I'm a Christian because He died for me. I'm a Christian because He forgave me. I'm a Christian because He stands beside me and helps me and grows in me. Nobody has ever loved me the way Jesus Christ loved me. I have wonderful family and wonderful friends. But Jesus is the one who died and had His hands nailed and His feet nailed down for me. Yes, we believe because of the evidence, but we love Him because of the cross. In Romans chapter 5, there are four adjectives from verse 6 on down to about verse 10 that describe us. He says, for when we were still without strength, that is when we were weak, In due time, Christ died for the ungodly, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man, someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates His own love towards us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, and much more than having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, Much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. Jesus, when He died, He died for people who were weak. People who couldn't save themselves. You can't save yourself by yourself. And I can't save myself by myself. I needed a Savior. I needed a Savior and He loved me enough to save me. Not only was I weak, but I was ungodly. What is the ungodly? Sometimes we think of an ungodly person as wicked. That's not really what it means. The ungodly person is the person who doesn't care about God. He doesn't give God a second thought. These Romans didn't know Jesus. They didn't know the Father in heaven. 
They'd never given a second thought to the Jewish God. They had their own gods. They had Caesar. Not only were they ungodly, but they had sinned against God. And were really by nature enemies of God. Jesus died for people who couldn't save themselves, who had never given Him a second thought, who had sinned against Him and was His enemy, and He still died for them. Who loves like that? Jesus Christ. And so there is the power of faith and truth and love, and there is the power of grace and forgiveness. These things are offered. Our consciences nag us and accuse us. Romans chapter 2, verses 14 to 16. And I think few experiences in life are more miserable than a guilty conscience knowing that we have done wrong and the shame that it produces within us. Anytime a person is guilty and ashamed of himself, he feels very small in his own eyes. Jeremiah wrote chapter 2 and verse 22. Though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, yet your iniquity is marked before me, says the Lord God. We can't save ourselves by ourselves. And apart from the blood of Jesus Christ, people cannot find salvation. And the unredeemed man is without strength to save himself. God wanted something better for people than a life that's enslaved to sin and bound for wrath. One that a person hates themselves for the things they've done, ashamed of the things they've done. And I think about Titus chapter 2 verse 11. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, that we should live soberly and righteously and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for Himself His own special people, zealous for good works. Let me tell you, God wants something better for you than to live in guilt and shame and sin. He's got something better for you. And the Lord God has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of His beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness, through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Wow! That's the power of grace. And if you had not heard the gospel, you would not know the grace and forgiveness of God and what He could do for you. So there is not only in that forgiveness, that grace, there is the power of peace. You see, when we are forgiven by God, we can have peace with ourselves. We can begin to have peace on the inside. That peace with God leads to peace with ourselves and peace with other people. Romans 5, verses 1 and 2, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. I can have peace and say, there's something better waiting for me. I tell you what, this whole world is wicked. It's always been wicked. It's not new wickedness. It's old wickedness. And it's gotten more and more wicked as days have gone by. But I tell you what, there's a place without wickedness that we can go to. And that's where our hope is. And that's where the grace of God is. When I think about a clean conscience, when I think about peace within, I think about how that that is brought about by love and obedience to the gospel. How that I can have peace of heart and mind in myself. We talked about a little bit yesterday about baptism. And I mentioned 1 Peter 3 and verse 21. That's when we call upon the name of the Lord. And it says there that baptism, corresponding to that baptism, now saves you. Not the removal of the dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God. An appeal to God for what? A good conscience. Why? Because I've had a bad conscience. And I want a good conscience. And I do that through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And I think about that. 
And when we're baptized and God raises us up to walk in newness of life and the old man of sin is dead, I don't have to live with what he did. I can be a new person with a clear conscience. That's the power of peace. And not only the power of peace, but the power of hope. Just like a fish without water, and just like a man without air, so is the soul without hope. 1 Timothy 1 and verse 1 talks about how Jesus is our hope. And without Him we have no hope. Ephesians 2 and verse 12. Without God and without hope in the world. That's where we are without Jesus. Colossians 3 and verse 1 says, If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things that are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. Folks, that's what we look forward to. The second coming. The coming of Jesus. The being with Him. The home we have in heaven. That place that is ours. Oh, I tell you, everything in the gospel in the gospel brings about life. Everything in the world brings about death. But everything that's in Christ brings about hope and life. And so it says in in Acts 4 and verse 12, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And the last power that I'd like to refer to is the power of joy. The power of joy. When David had sinned with Bathsheba and had Uriah slaughtered in battle, he felt the sting of his conscience. And David recognized the weight and the pain of that unresolved sin in his life. And he said in Psalm 32, verses 3 and 4, he says, When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me and my vitality was turned into the drought of summer. You see, that's what happens when you have unresolved sin in your life. But in another psalm, Psalm 51, there David says, Make me... Hear joy and gladness, that the bones that you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. And create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with your generous spirit. Psalm 51, 8 to 12. You see, whenever he kept silent, whenever he didn't deal with things, the hand of God was heavy upon him. And you know what? There's a lot of hurting people and broken people in our world today who do all kinds of things because of the weight of the guilty things that are upon them. I can remember back in the 80s, Garrett, there was all this talk about All this talk in those days about self-esteem and how important self-esteem was. And they talked about somebody who was healthy and somebody who was good-looking and somebody who was athletic and somebody who was smart. And, you know, back in those days, I didn't have many of those things. But you know what they never talked about when they talked about self-esteem? They never talked about how sin gets into the lives of people and they dislike themselves. Now, psychologists can talk about all of these things and give you this answer and that, but what they can't do is give you an answer to your sins. 
That's the power of the gospel and what it can do. Now, what I'm saying to you that as you teach your friends and as you look at your life and as you work with people, remember that you are not powerless, that you have that power of faith and hope and love and truth and grace and forgiveness, that you have peace, that you have hope, and you have joy. And all of that power together can make a difference to help bring somebody whose life is broken and sad and they're hurting and they don't know where things are going to give them something better than they have had. Oh yes, God can transform your life and He will do it if you let Him. If you'll be just like some of those Romans who recognize who they would obey, that they would obey righteousness and how that they from their hearts obeyed the gospel from their hearts. They obeyed what was that form of doctrine. And God freed them from the sin and they became servants of righteousness. They changed and you can change too. You can be the man or the woman of God that you would love to be. It's there for you. And the power to do it has always been there. And it can be found in this book and in the blood of Jesus. Oh, how badly, how very badly we need the power of the gospel to be reminded to us who are Christians and how badly the people who are lost need the power of the gospel to bring healing to broken souls, to bring comfort to those who mourn in sin, to bring life to those who are dead. Folks, that's what they need. That's what they need. The gospel. And that's why we have to provide it wherever, whenever, to whomever we can, as often as we can, and with as much love as we can have. Maybe you and your heart and life are broken and you need the power of the gospel. Oh, I know if you're not yet a Christian, you need to believe with all your heart that Jesus is the Christ. Repent of your sins Confess the name of Jesus, that He is the Christ, the Son of God. And to be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. It might be that you're a brother or sister. That you've been flirting with the things that make you ashamed of yourself. And you need to repent. To be honest and confess those sins and ask God to forgive you. If you have any need tonight, we pray that you won't just sit there, that you'll do something about it, that you'll respond while we stand and sing.